Let's talk about pulse ox. What is it? It's the percentage of hemoglobin in your blood that is holding oxygen. It's SpO2. It's not the same thing as SaO2, which you get from a blood draw. So how does it work? It shoots light at one end and it's detected at the other end. This is dependent on three things, Beer's law, Lambert's law, and oxy and deoxyhemoglobin absorbing infrared and red light differently. So what's Beer's law? Beer's law is, states that the light absorbed is directly proportionate to what is absorbing it. Lambert's law is the light absorbed is directly proportionate to uh, the length of the path the light has to take. And lastly, oxyhemoglobin absorbs more infrared light, which is at 950 nanometers, than red light, which is 650 nanometers. Deoxyhemoglobin, on the other hand, absorbs more red light than infrared light. So the machine detects how much red light and infrared light has been absorbed. Thus, it can provide a percentage from that ratio. And that's the number you see, SpO2. Now that we've talked about how pulse ox works, let's talk about some pitfalls and clinical pearls. First one being pulse ox is inaccurate at lower concentrations. Why is that? Well, for Beer's Law and Lambert Law to work perfectly, we need the light to travel in a straight path. So, for example, um, in this example, this is red light and infrared light. We need it to go straight through our fingers. Um, but our blood is viscous and it's got particles, so the light will scatter. So there will be inaccuracies, right? So in order to overcome this, what we did was, or what people did was come up with a calibration graph. So an individual would be getting some oxygen um, and they would start getting less and less oxygen over time. And as that is happening, we're taking blood draws and we're also measuring it on a pulse, uh, pulse ox. So the blood draw will give you the accurate depiction of w what the level of oxygen is in their body. The pulse ox with the inaccuracies will spit out a number and we calibrated that. So theoretically we can only go so low because these are human volunteers. So around 70%, um, 50 to 70% is when it, it starts getting inaccurate. Let's move on to the next one, uh, movement. Movement increases the chances of error. Why is that? To understand that, let's take a small finger, for example, and a bigger finger, for example. This pulse ox is gonna read different amount of light coming through, obviously, because there's gonna be more tissue on, on the uh, bigger finger, such as fat. So in order to overcome that, what they did was the reading of the pulse ox what it gets is this steady amount and this pulsatile amount. So the steady amount is the arterial blood. It's the alternating current. It's the AC. This is the changing amount, sorry. And the steady amount is the DC. It's the direct current. It's the non-arterial skin, tissue, whatever is steady. The problem with this is the AC is only 2% of the entire reading. So what happens with that is um, if you move or if the patient moves or if the probe isn't placed perfectly or it's not the right size, increases the chances of error because it's such a small percentage of the whole thing. So that brings it to a side note of plethysmographic trace, aka pleth. It's the pulse stop flow that's shown in a graph next to your SpO2. So for example, you'll see 99% and you'd see this trace. And it's always recommended to check this trace because if there's a poor signal, uh, pleth signal, it can lead to inaccurate O2 stats. Um, so this signal can be affected by low blood pressures, um, such as low cardiac output states, uh, or if you gave a presser, 
um, or if the patient is even shivering and has low temperature, these can all affect the pleth, so it's recommended to look at that. Next caveat we have is surrounding light. So it's going to get the infrared and the red light, but it's the machine is also going to get some room light. How does it overcome that? It shoots either the infrared light or the red light one at a time. And what happens is during those times, you're also going to have room light. And then it has a brief period of time where there's no light coming in at all and only the room light is coming in. So what it can do at that point is calculate the amount of room light and that's coming in and basically take that out of the equation. So this happens hundreds of times uh, in a second. So it's cycling through this constantly. The problem with that is the fit has to be perfect and the amount of room light um, cannot change frequently if the fit's not perfect. Too much ambient light can overpower this, so covering the finger might help. And when this does happen, the SpO2 is read at a lower concentration than it actually is. Next, we have hyperoxia. So say, for example, there are two hemoglobin molecules saturated with oxygen. The pulse ox is going to see 100%. Say in this scenario, there are also two hemoglobin molecules attached to oxygen, but there's all this extra oxygen around. Well, the pulse ox is only looking for oxygenated hemoglobin versus deoxygenated hemoglobin. So it's still going to see 100%. So it's these two out of two. Let's talk about some other things that might interfere with pulse ox. Um, some of the most common are dyes, such as methylene blue dye, indocyanin green, and ceramide. Nail polish, especially blue nail polish, and electromagnetic interference. All of these will display a falsely low SpO2. So in reality, the oxygen levels will be higher than they actually seem to be. Other things that might cause this are shivering, motion, ambient light, like we talked about, uh, anything that causes low perfusion to the limb. Uh, all of these will cause a falsely low SpO2 reading. Interestingly enough, what doesn't have any effect um, is bilirubin, hemoglobin F, so fetal hemoglobin, or HBS, sickle hemoglobin, acrylic nails, and fluorescent dyes. So these things will not have an effect on the pulse ox reading. Let's talk about some clinical scenarios that might interfere with pulse ox or have some considerations to keep in mind. Two of the most common being met hemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobinemia. Let's start with met hemoglobinemia and let's start with what it is. So it is when the iron in the hemoglobin goes from Fe plus 2 to Fe plus 3. How does this show up on a pulse lock? So to understand that, we need to go back to the R number. The R number is ACDC of 660 nanometers over ACDC of 960, or sorry, 940 nanometers. What this is, is the ratio of active pulse tile flow over the non pulse tile flow at 660 nanometer divided by the ratio of active pulse tile flow over inactive non pulse tile flow observed at 940 nanometers. So this is reported as a ratio and as you can imagine if 
let's say for example there's no finger at all in the pulse ox the amount of red light and the infrared light detected will be even the absorption ratios will be the same meaning it will be one to one in this case what happens on the pulse ox is it shows 85 percent this is the exact same thing that happens during met hemoglobinemia. So the increased amount of met hemoglobin in your blood will cause the SpO2 to reach 85%. So increased met hemoglobin or no finger will both result in a SpO2 of close to 85%. What this means is, in reality, if your true SpO2 was higher than 85%, then you have a falsely low reading. But if your true SpO2 was less than 85%, you'll have a falsely high reading. So what causes this? Uh, the common causes are metroclopramide, dapsone, nitric oxide, nitroglycerine, and pyrocaine uh, topicalization. The treatment is either methylene blue or vitamin C. And do you guys remember what methylene blue uh, has to do with pulse ox? So what it, it's a dye, right? So it can cause a falsely low reading of SpO2. Next, let's talk about carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, it's basically carbon monoxide bound to hemoglobin. It's got about 200 times the affinity that oxygen does for hemoglobin. So your body's going to have trouble oxygenating tissue. What does this have to do with pulse ox? So to understand that, we have to know the fact that the absorption the absorbance of carboxyhemoglobin is about the same as the absorption as uh, oxygenated hemoglobin. What does this mean? This means that the pulse ox is going to get the same ratio of infrared light to red light if you can recall that the Oxyhemoglobin absorbs more infrared light than red light, and this is essentially the same thing carbon monoxide does. So they'll both um, report similarly. What does this mean? This means that if, let's say, half of your hemoglobin is bound to carbon dioxide, um, or carbon monoxide, sorry, and in reality, the other half, so your SaO2 in reality is 50%. What this will report as is actually an SpO2 of 95%, which is falsely high. So what causes this? The three of the most common causes for our uh, discussion here are smoke inhalation, volatile anesthetic degradation, and soda lime. The treatment here would be 100% FiO2 and hyperbaric O2. So that's comparing uh, met hemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. Let's talk about the third most common clinical scenario um, that's seen with or that has to do with the pulse ox which is cyanide toxicity what happens so what happens is there is uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation sorry so your body is having trouble the body is going to have trouble extracting the oxygen. The oxygen will still be in the blood. What this means is high SpO2 
despite clinical cyanosis. And why is this special? It's because cyanosis, when you see it clinically, usually the SpO2 is going to be around 85%, or you will see that. In this case, you won't see that despite the high um, SpO2 and cyanosis. So what causes this? The causes are sodium nitrate peroxide, smoke inhalation, um, and the treatment is hydroxycobalamin, cobalamin, which is also vitamin B12.